All right, guys. So how many people here, I need to know this first in, in this message, how many people here have seen uh, the Harry Potter movies? Hands up in the air. Just a few people. Okay. That's important to know where we're going. So let me tell you a story, and this story has a little bit. It's connected to Harry Potter. All right, down in Southern California, there's a place called Universal Studios. Who's been there to Universal Studios? Shout out. I forget the hands. Okay, Universal Studios. And in Universal Studios, there's something that's connected to Harry Potter. Does anybody know what that is? There's Harry Potter land in Universal Studios. Like, so if you don't know about Harry Potter, it's just this ni- funny little story about wizards and all this kind of stuff. It's not really bad. Actually, it's got a lot of Christian analogies and connections, especially as the books went on. So, but there's Harry Potter land. So everybody in this land is dressed up like wizards and all, they have all these magic wands and everything. Well, we went down there a couple of years ago, okay? And my family, has anybody actually been to Harry Potter land? Nobody except my family? Okay, well, when you go there, if you know the movies of Harry Potter, there's this famous scene where Harry Potter gets his wand. He goes into like a wand shop, and the wand chooses him, and it's like this amazing moment, okay? Well, I'll tell you that we had, at at Harry Potter land, there is the wand shop and the wand choosing ceremony. So let me tell you an amazing story of what happened in the wand choosing ceremony. All right, now I was off with our younger kids, but Amber, my wife, she takes our older kids into the wand choosing ceremony. First, they wait in line a long time to get into this wand choosing ceremony. And then everybody's in there, and they come up, and they have to pick somebody that they're going to have be the person who's like Harry Potter that gets to, gets to check out the wands and be chosen. And they picked Carter. It was amazing. So they picked Carter, and Carter's going through this whole process. And you got to remember, this is, I mean, it's like Universal Studios. It's like Disneyland. The whole environment is awesome and amazing. And so they're going through this process where he, he gets to te- test these wands, and, oh, nope, that's the wrong wand. It does bad stuff. Oh, that's the wrong wand again. And everybody, a whole room full of people is watching Carter do this. Okay, and then, re- and then they bring out, they bring out the wand. Okay, and when Carter pulls out the wand in the wand choosing ceremony, the wand, this wand actually works. So you got to think what this moment's like. He's standing there, all these people are watching him, and he gets to point this wand at the wall. And the wands are interactive, so this is all like connected. He points it where they tell him, and the whole room lights up like heaven. And then he points it somewhere else, you know, and like whatever happens, a bird becomes a frog. It's the wand works for him. He is the chosen one. And Carter's sitting there. I don't know what he was thinking at the moment. Oh, I'm, he's not in here. He's with, the, he's with the kids, so I can say whatever I want about him. He's thinking, oh, it's amazing. I'm, I'm the one. Finally, I found I'm the chosen one. And then they say, all right, chosen one, please remain behind as all the other people go out of the room because you've been chosen. So Carter remains behind with Amber. And they say, all right, chosen one. And they do this whole thing in character. They say, chosen one, you've been given this wand, and if you'd like to take it home today, you can take it home for only $60. (laughs) Now, I didn't have a job at this moment. We didn't have $60 to spend on a wand, and Carter, the chosen one, we're gonna, mom's going to have to say to him, sorry, you're not chosen because we don't have enough money. <laughs> All right, this, this story is very important for where we're going in the message in just a minute because here's what happens. Amber, in a moment like this, Amber is a high justice person. Let me hear a shout out from high justice people in the room. And Amber, when she feels that fire, fire down in her bones, when she feels that, she believes that she can overcome any objection that's in front of her. And so she says to this wizard standing in front of her, all in his getup, she says, no, 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 no. This is wrong. Are you telling me you do this every time? You gear somebody up and then you gouge them for $60 and make their parents buy this or the kid's going to go home screaming and crying. Carter wasn't going to. He's older. 
She said, are you kidding me? And they said, oh, this is what we do. We, we don't give away wands. We've never given away wands. So she argues back and forth with this guy for quite a while, maybe five, ten minutes. And my uncle's there, who's really a, kind of a loud mouth. Hope you're not watching this, Uncle Rod. Oh, he's, and he's, he's like the bad cop in this situation. He's like, bah, I can't believe this. Bah. But Amber knows two things. She knows, number one, that these guys are trained so that if she's still talking with them about a problem, they're not allowed to leave her until she leaves first. And she knows, number two, that if she gets mad and yells and screams, they're allowed to kick her out. But if she doesn't, they're not. And so she just keeps repeating herself emphatically to this guy until this guy can't figure out what he's going to do. <laughs> okay? He can't figure out what he's going to do. And so he finally says, okay, I'm going to, she says, I got to see your manager. And he says, okay, I'm going to go get the manager. So the manager comes out who is like the grand wizard. He's the manager in the grand wizard hat. And she does the same thing with the manager. And for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, back and forth with the manager. And he's saying, no, 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 we're not allowed to do this. We never do this. But Amber won't leave. And finally she says, I don't know, I don't know who your boss is, but I need to see your boss. Okay, so she's already gone through two wizards. And now the guy comes out who's not a wizard. Now the guy comes out who's actually wearing a suit and tie. Now the guy comes out who actually gets paid the big money by Universal Studios, and he's got to deal with this mom who won't leave. And she goes back and forth with him, and he's, he's higher level. He's saying the same things. He very eloquently and very tactfully tells her all the reasons why it doesn't make sense to give away wands, and they just can't do that. I'm sorry. He invites her to leave, and she says no. And she very tactfully and eloquently and forcefully, firmly but not angrily, tells him all the reasons why it's wrong what they're doing. And right at the point where in her heart she was about to give up, she confessed this to me last night. She was about to give up. The guy says, we don't want any of our guests to go away unhappy. We're going to give you this wand. <laughs> so apparently we walked away with the only wand that's ever been given away for free, for free by Universal Studios in California. Apparently. <laughs> so that's our story to start us off. And we're going to be referring back to that story as we move through the message because today we're dealing with Luke chapter 18 and what's often called the parable of the persistent widow. And you're going to see as you look at this parable that Jesus tells, you're going to see this is exactly what Jesus was getting at. You're going to see that Amber's story right there is a demonstration, uh, brings it right into modern life for us of how, what Jesus was talking about. And then we're going to use that to explain what Jesus is trying to explain in this passage, which is what is faith. All right, so, so here we go. We're about to jump into it. The point that I want you to come away with, one of the main points I want you to come away with was th is this. This is the first point in your bulletin notes. When God is really your only hope, you will keep on praying and never lose heart. This is Jesus' point in the text that we're going to look at today, in this book of Luke, chapter 18. Okay, now at the end of this chapter, I'm going to actually read one line from the end of what we're going to, the rest of what we're going to read in a minute. I'm not sure. It might be out of order on the PowerPoint. But this comes right from the end of what we're, so this is uh, chapters 18, verse 8. 18 verse 8 at the end, this is in your bulletins too. Jesus says this, at the end of this parable, the end of this teaching, he says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Now, when he says Son of Man, he's referring to himself. And if you remember last week, he had talked about how he was going to return. There is something big that's coming that nobody's going to be ready for unless they follow his advice and are really prepared talked about being prepared last week. And that big thing that's coming is Jesus is coming back. It's going to happen suddenly, and nobody's going to know when it's going to happen. And you're not, if you're not prepared, bad things are going to happen. If you are, great things are going to happen. But here he says, when that happens, when he returns, will he find any faith on the earth? So this whole teaching, and actually this whole section we've been going through in this sermon series, we're almost at the end of this series of messages get to know what Jesus really taught. And in this whole section, he's been trying to explain, trying to give us uh, vivid illustrations, a vision of what faith actually is. 
Now, if you've hung around the church very long, you've ever heard Christians talk, you'll know that Christians are constantly talking about faith. Why? And what in the world is faith exactly? I mean, even after I became a Christian and had faith, sometimes it's been hard for me to grasp that. What is faith? What's a concrete picture of what this looks like? How do I actually step out in faith in my life? And here's basically how it works. I mean, faith is the way in. Okay, believing in God, as Jesus has said a bunch of times, believing in him, then your sins can be forgiven. You can enter a relationship with God. We talked about that last week. In Jesus' terms, you can enter the kingdom of God. You can live in his world right now. You can enter it and live in it. And there are massive advantages to living in it because there are resources available in that kingdom that are not available if you just live a normal life in this world. We're going to see that as we move on with this parable. So faith, faith is the way in. Faith also is something that energizes us. Because when you have faith in something and you step out in that faith, it produces hope. Christians are not just always talking about faith, but they're talking about faith, hope, joy, and love. Those are the four things Christians probably talk about the most. That's the four things Jesus talked about the most. We're called, we call ourselves as a church a community of hope. And what hope is, is a real expectation that what, something good could happen here. Something good could happen here. And you see this actually in the story that I told about Amber. Right? In that story, she had confidence, she had faith, she had trust in what? That she could, she could convince this manager at some point up in the chain, she could convince them, she had trust that she could convince them to give us that wand. And when she stepped out in that trust, in that faith, and actually acted on it, it produced a hope in her that allowed her to keep going. And when that hope is realized, when we start to see things happen because of that hope, in the life with God, that is, God actually doing stuff in our life. In the story, it was that guy gave us the wand. What do you think that felt like in that moment? Joy. Joy. And then love and an ability to share that love with other people. Now, the story is a microcosm. It's just a little picture of what really life with God is like. And that's how Jesus is going to use this story that we're looking at right now. Faith is the way in. It produces hope, which allows you to keep going. That hope, once you see God responding, produces joy, and then you're able to live a life full of love. That's how it works in following Jesus. Now let's jump right into the parable. I'm going to read it for you here, and we're going to see this widow, this widow who just goes for it. I think what you're going to see is Jesus is describing, actually, I think this is a kind of person. Not everybody has this personality, but what Jesus is going to be telling us isn't that you have to have this personality. He's saying, this is the kind of thing you need to implement in your life with God. That's what he's saying. So keep that in mind as we go through here. And also keep that story in mind of Amber and the magic wand. Okay? Because, because that's going to help us grab onto the story that Jesus is telling. Because this widow, while she might have been an older woman, is not necessarily an older woman. In the ancient world, their people died all the time at different ages. Life expectancy was much lower. And we know even just from reading the Bible that many widows were younger women. So this could be any age woman. Jesus doesn't tell us. He's just grabbing at a certain kind of personality. So let's dive into it. You can follow along with me. I'm going to read it first. Then we'll talk about it. We'll talk about what it means. And we'll talk about what this widow might have done differently or what someone else might have done in her position. All right, so... Luke chapter 18, starting at verse 1. Jesus told his disciples a parable. So a little story that's going to get inside you and change your life later. To show them that they should always pray and never give up. Or another translation would be never lose heart. So that's the purpose he's going after. What, what he wants people to, how he wants to change his followers, his followers, his friends, his students, is he wants to change them into people who will constantly pray and never give up. And this is what he does to do it. He said, this is the parable, in a certain town, there was a judge who didn't fear God and he didn't care what people thought. 
okay? So this is, this is not a very uh, nice guy or admirable guy. He doesn't care about God. He doesn't care about people. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea. So she's coming to him asking again and again, grant me justice against my adversary. She's not just asking for help, like I don't have enough money, I can't feed myself, please help me. There's something somebody's actually done wrong to her. And she's asking for justice. She's a high justice person. And for some time, he refused. The judge refused. But finally, he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think. Can you imagine saying this to yourself? Even though I don't care about God or care about anybody else. That's where I'm at. Yet because this widow keeps on bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. Now, the words that are being translated here are hilarious. Actually, there's kind of a debate over how to translate them because the word in Greek means literally to give someone a black eye. What the judge says is that I better give her justice or she's eventually going to come and give me a black eye. Boom. So you can see from this what kind of, what, uh, how the widow is asking, right? She is very forceful in the way that she's coming to this judge again and again. And then Jesus says, the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. Okay? So you heard what he said. He's going to do it even though he hates God and hates people, just because she keeps bugging him. And won't God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. But, as we already read before, when the Son of Man returns, when Jesus returns, will he find any faith on the earth? He leaves that as an open question. So let's talk about this widow for a minute. And the point that I want to drive home here is this. Second point in your bulletin notes. There is a moment, actually many moments in life, there is a moment when we must decide to step out in faith. There is a moment when we must decide to step out in faith. We got a bunch of people moving on to different stages of life today, don't we? We got Michael, our pastoral intern, moving on to a new stage of life. We've got the grade sixes moving up to the scary youth group. Youth group is really scary, actually. I kind of freak out every week before I go. Um, and we've got, we're going to celebrate the grads who are moving into a new, quite unknown stage of life. And for all of us in every stage of life that we're in, there is a moment when we need to decide to step out in faith. And that's exactly what this story about the widow that Jesus gives us, that's what she does. Now, what we're going to do to grab onto that and see it is we're going to compare this widow the widow who has faith, we're going to compare the widow who has faith with a widow who doesn't have faith. A widow Jesus doesn't talk about, but we're going to compare the widow who has faith with what someone else might have done in this same situation. Okay? So we can grab that slide up there, the comparison slide. The widow with faith. We see, number one, that whatever the problem is that she has, it's a problem of justice. Somebody has done something wrong to her. And there's only actually one person in her life who can fix that problem. That's the judge. And she recognizes that and accepts it. She accepts there's only one way this is going to get fixed. And it has to get fixed. The only way it can get fixed is if this judge, even though he's a bad guy, he gives me justice. Nobody else can fix it. You see that in Amber's story, Amber and the Magic Wand, right? There was only one guy, wasn't there, who could make it right. She couldn't fix it herself. She couldn't go to someone else in the park. She couldn't make a wand herself. Only the manager, the high-level manager of Universal Studios could give that wand away. Only one person. And she accepts that. However, someone else in the same situation might do something very different. They might try to put their hope in something else, even though it's obvious, if you think about it, that no one else can solve the problem. And don't we do this all the time? 
We have a whole bunch of problems in our lives that really, if we think carefully about it, that problem can only get solved. This evil, this wrong that's in the world, in somebody else's life, in my friend's heart, in my own heart, can only get fixed by who? God. No one else can do it. And yet, because, we'll get to why in a couple of minutes, for a number of reasons, maybe because it's hard, maybe because it's uncomfortable, or maybe just because God is invisible, He's not right in front of us, we spend a lot of our time looking after other solutions, trying to fix it ourselves, or trying to have somebody else fix it, even though those solutions can never work. They can be maybe part of the answer, but without God stepping in and fixing the problem Himself, it can't get fixed. So the widow who has faith, she accepts that. The widow who doesn't have faith that we're imagining here, she puts her hope in lesser things. Now, number two, we see that the widow who has faith, just like Amber, believes that the judge will eventually help her. The widow in the story, she believes that she can, just by coming and asking this judge again and again, even though he's a bad dude, she can overwhelm him and eventually get him to do what she wants. She believes it. Now, that's not actually quite the same way that we respond to God. We're going to get to that in a few minutes. But this is what Jesus is pointing out, that she believes it, just like Amber believed it. She had that fire inside of her because something was wrong. This is not okay. And that fire inside of her made her believe, I can overcome this person. I can do it. I can keep persisting and boldly asking this person until they give me justice in this situation until they make it right. She believes it. But what would most people do in that situation? I mean, like I said, this is apparently, at least at that time, the only free wand that had ever been given away at Universal Studios. Right? So what did most moms do in that situation? They paid the $60 maybe so their kid wouldn't scream, even though they knew it was wrong. Or maybe they asked the first person but gave up quickly and went away. Maybe they even got to the second guy, but they didn't persist to the top-level manager who was the only guy who could solve the problem. You see? They didn't push hard enough. They didn't have the fire that would take them there. So because of that, because they don't believe it, they either never ask or they ask and give up. Same thing with the widow that Jesus is describing. You see how he's actually describing a woman with a certain kind of personality. That's what he's grabbing at here, something that all the people listening to him had experienced in certain people that they knew in their lives. How many of you have, have someone in your life who's persistent and bold and has fire in them like this when something is not just? How many of you know somebody like that? Yeah, we well, all know Amber, so there you go. Okay, so you can see that the, because the widow in the story is, because she believes this, she's then bold, and she steps out in faith. I want you to imagine that moment, okay? Put yourself in her place, and imagine that moment. She knows, she knows that only the judge can fix it. But she also knows it's going to be hard to do that. It's going to take boldly going to him and asking him again and again, and it's going to take persistence, and it's going to be uncomfortable maybe, and it's going to be uh, maybe embarrassing to be known as the one who's constantly cry crying out to this judge for help. And there's that moment when she has, she's at home, she knows it's unjust. On the one hand, she's got this fire of it's not right, and on the other hand, she's got this, this feeling of it's going to be really hard. And at that moment, she's got to make a decision. And that is stepping out in faith. Often in our life with God, in our life, we know what's true about God, but we don't act on it. We, in that moment, go, it's going to be too hard. Or we convince ourselves, no, he would never, he would never. But faith, stepping out in faith, is to say, I am going for it. I know that this thing needs to change, and I am going for it like that widow. So we can see this is the story that Jesus is bringing to us. And now let's look at what does he do with it? What does Jesus do with it? And here his main point 
is going to be simply about this. It's going to be about who God is. And for your next point in the bulletin, you can write this down. Many of us don't believe that God really wants to help us. Many of us know that God really wants to help us. If you asked us, does God, is God good? Does he love you? Yes, yes. Does he want to help you in your life? Of course. But to believe something is to act like it's true. And many of us, myself included, I'm not just coming at you. I'm coming at me too. Many of us don't act like it's true. We act like God is the unjust judge. As we were preparing for this message, we were having one of these uh, message preparation meetings, and, and somebody in the meeting would have brought this out, that, it, look it, God is, Jesus it does this astonishing thing, that in the parable, the unjust judge, this bad judge, is in the same place as who? God, in the way that he uses it. Well, what is Jesus doing there? Is he saying God is an unjust judge? No. He's saying that many people feel like God is. And in fact, Jesus is using the whole thing to say, look, God's not like that. He's not like that. God's the one who wants to help you. If, if this widow could overcome that evil judge, don't you think that if you cry out to God day and night and really come at him boldly with a prayer, with something that needs to happen in the world, something wrong that needs to be fixed, don't you think God, who loves you and gave his son, gave his son's own life, died for you, don't you think that that God will answer your prayer? Jesus is trying to wake us up. He's trying to wake us up to what's real here because many of us act like, act like God is the unjust judge. God is the only one who can fix this. That's the last point for your bulletin this morning. You know the situations in life that we're talking about. The situations in life where only God is the one who can fix it. Think about a situation where something is really wrong. You have a friend who doesn't know God and they're destroying their life. God is the only one who can fix it. You in yourself find yourself unable to forgive someone for something that they've done wrong to you. And you can't get yourself to do that no matter how hard you try. Say it with me. God is the only one who can fix this. God is the only one who can fix this. There's someone else in your life who they think life is just fine. Uh, They're they're not worried. They're not having a bad time. But they are totally apathetic to the condition of their soul and what's going to happen in the future. And there's nothing you can say to make them interested in God or care about it. God is the only one who can fix this. He's the only one. Everything that we try to do together as a church, helping people grow, say that with me if you can, helping people grow in their relationship with God and with each other, that is impossible for human beings to do. We cannot emphasize it enough or often enough. We can't do that. We can do our part in it, but it can't happen unless God does it because God is the only one who can fix this. He's the only one. And Jesus is saying to us that this is how we need to look at it. We need to recognize these people in our lives who when they see something that's wrong, they dive in and they go after the only one who can fix it until they get justice. And Jesus says this is how we need to act toward God. This is how we need to pray, pray, pray. We need to come to God boldly and seek him until he answers. And he's not the unjust judge. He's not a God who hates us and doesn't want to do things for us. He loves us and he will give us justice quickly. It doesn't mean that God will always answer every prayer you have. But if you do this, I guarantee on the basis of the words of the Lord Jesus Christ that you will receive an answer. And things will change, even if you don't get exactly what you're asking for. So in wrapping up the message, I want to give you a challenge. And you might want to write this down. I want to give you a challenge, what you could do with this. You want to put 
feet on the ground with this message, here's what you could do. Pick, realize, decide, ask, ask, watch. That's what you can do. Pick, realize, decide, ask, ask, and watch. Number one, pick a problem. Pick a problem that's in your life that you realize, you recognize, uh, God's the only one who can fix. Pick a problem that's in your life where something is really wrong. Someone you know, in your own heart, in your own family. Pick a problem. Next, realize. Do the math and realize that God is the only one who can fix it. Think about that carefully and recognize that there's no other solution if God doesn't come in and do it. Pick, realize, decide. Just like the widow, just like Amber, decide to step out in faith. And that step of faith is to seek God boldly until he answers. He's promised he'll answer. I mean, who are we? If we, if we say we believe that God will change the world through our prayers, which is what the Bible says, because of what Jesus has done for us, and then we pray as if that's not true, or we hardly pray at all, do we really believe it? We're certainly not deciding to step out in faith. Pick, realize, decide. Ask him boldly. Ask him persistently. And then watch and see what happens. Like we said before, he won't always give us exactly what we're asking for because he loves us too much. And we often ask for the wrong things, but he will always answer the prayer that comes to him through Jesus boldly and persistently from the heart of a true follower who loves him. Do you believe it's true? And will you decide to step out in faith? Let's pray.